Okay. So just as a matter of uh, process, if you could just say your name and then spell it for us so we have the correct spelling. Okay. <laughs> My name is Daniel Burns, D-A-N-I-E-L-B-U-R-N-S. Okay. Daniel, maybe we could just start off a little bit with you talking about your, you know, where you grew up and uh, maybe sort of earliest recollections of when you uh, started realizing that you didn't identify with sort of the heterodominative culture. Okay, I grew up on the east side of Michigan. I am a Michigander. Um, I grew up in the Tri-Cities. Uh, sometimes um, I would move around in the area. I've lived in most of the Tri-Cities. Uh, my earliest recollection would be, um, I was actually fairly young, um, probably around eight. Mm -hmm. And what, uh, hold on, I started bouncing. Is that too high? No, that's that's fine, okay. Um, I was about eight years old, and I uh, started noticing women mar more than I did with the boys. Since I was about two years old, I've always played with solely boys. That was my only friends. Mm. And I saw, the, I saw the girls differently, because I'm biologically a female, so everybody thought you know, that I'm a female, instead of um, seeing me as a more masculine individual. And so there was a little bit of a internal struggle with that with my very devout religious um, mother and father who very much brought that up in the household and saying, you know, marriage is only between a man and a woman and there's no other thing except that. So there was a lot of discord at a very young age because I recognized it right away that I was, you know, attracted to female um, individuals instead of you know, male individuals, which was a problem for my parents, so. And, and, you know, and maybe, and maybe, you know, as you, you grew older, you know, in school, you know, what was the reaction from, you had from friends or classmates or other folks? I mean, you know, were people generally accepting? Um, did you have any difficulties with just sort of, you know, people sort of accepting you were kind of in that kind of educational setting and at, at the maybe middle school, high school level? Well, it's a small town of 1,400 people. Uh, there was no possibility of coming out mm. uh, there because it was also the, the religion there was very, um, the only religion, uh, you only did, thing, did that thing. Everybody knew everybody else um, and more or less knew their business. Mm. So there, there wasn't an opportunity. Okay. I knew I was different than everybody else, but I more or less kept that to myself. And every time I kind of you know, would lean towards that way, there was always a check point. It was like somebody checked me back into mm. that box. Mm. And uh, so there wasn't much freedom with that small town um, atmosphere, personality, you know, however you want to describe it. Mm. But I knew internally, you know, there was no de um, denouncing it or anything. I just knew. And I was always kind of just seen as one of the guys, which was kind of an exception to the rule hmm. instead of the rule, which hmm. was actually kind of interesting for a small town. Hmm. And now, I mean, how do you think that that affected you, uh, not being able to be public with you know, who you were and how you felt about things? I mean, um, you know, how, did you, how did you cope with that, that reality of not being able to, like it wasn't an option, as you say, to, to come yeah. out? Well, I think it prolonged my coming out process. I have no doubt about that. I would have came out a lot earlier. Uh, one of the great things that happened, though, was uh, my high school split, and I had to move halfway through my high school year. And uh, that was actually the first time uh, that I knew for a fact because somebody came out to me as being gay. And it was such a positive experience and a positive outcome that that has impacted my life um, from then on out. Once I was able to, because uh, I also had a little bit more freedom because there was about four individuals in that high school who was living out as gay and as a lesbian. And you know, some people were hostile with that, and, but a lot of people, they had a good group of friends who were very supportive and called people out on it. And so that made my um, area to kind of wiggle around and uh, say 
how far can I go with this? You know, because it was also, I was still, you know, 16, 17, 18. And so you're still wanting to be part of the crowd and everything. Um, that, you know, it didn't give me total freedom, but it was that one stepping stone that I needed. So when I went to college that I could come out and say, hey, I'm attracted to women. Uh, I don't quite fit the, the stereotype of what it means to be um, female. Uh, and I know that very much uh, kind of um, fostered my college uh, beginning too, because I got my BA first in sociology. And it was because I very much uh, wanted to know what was this so this drastic difference between what it means to be male and female. Because since I was, um, I'm three years older than my brother, since I was about five, because my brother was a little bit older at that point, I couldn't understand the difference. Mm -hmm. And I constantly went back and forth with my parents going, you know, well, if Andrew can do that, why can't I do that? And, you know, well, you know, what, what's the difference? And even though I have an older sister, there wasn't that connection to that. It was like, I couldn't understand. I understood why, you know, I didn't do the exact same things as my sister, but I didn't understand why I couldn't do the exact same things as my brother and what was so incredibly different between the two of us. That just never clicked as a child. And, you know, once I got older, you know, there was, you know, the whole conversation about, you know, anatomy is different, and so boys do this, girls do that, and by the way, you're a girl, and he's a boy, so that's why these, and I fought that. You know, my parents will even today say that I constantly fight that. So I think those two things are very much what impacted why I, you know, study the things that I do and why I'm going down the career path that I am. Mm. Let's jump forward a little bit and talk about you know when you first decided to come to Grand Valley. Uh, you know what year was that, and then you know kind of where where you were at at that point in your life when you first came to, to, to this campus. Okay, uh, I went. I came to Grand Valley in 2000 and um, hold on one second. It was three semester ago, so it was that 2009. No, it was January 2010, because that'd be 10 semester, yeah. Uh, and I was to the point um, a few years prior to that where I was trying to find a way to get kind of out of that area. Uh, the area uh, in the Tri-Cities is not extremely conducive um, for where I was at in my coming out process. I wanted a little bit more freedom. I wanted to be more specifically farther away from my parents and from my family because it's not just my parents who are very devoutly religious, it's my um, family who has those points of views and are not very welcoming of who I am and uh, what I'm doing with my life, to quote them. Uh, so I wanted to move farther away. And I felt that Grand Valley was a really good place to go um, because of financial means I couldn't go all the way to San Francisco or someplace like that, which that would have been fun. <laughs> but uh, for financial reasons, plus I had worked in, uh, I had graduated and worked for a while and the stock market had just um, crashed and I had been like three years in um, working and trying to find work and couldn't and I wanted to know that I wanted to go back into the medical field and I knew that Grand Valley was a good place to go for that. And more importantly, when I came and visited the campus, there was an LGBT center there. And when I visited there, there were students in there talking. Uh, I met Carrie and uh, several other people there that first day um, during the summer when I had visited and they were very welcoming. And the atmosphere, because I had to ask a few questions on my tour, was very different. Um, than Saginaw Valley. Um, Saginaw Valley had only, in, at that time at the GSA, had, there was only about five of us who were um, queer or part of the LGBT community, and the rest were all allies. Versus I could tell here that uh, I wouldn't just have an ally family, I would have an LGBT and ally family, which was what I was looking for. And plus, I wanted to make that huge step of being able to live you know, at least most of my um, life uh, 
as being uh, male and changing my name and stuff like that. You know, with work and everything, that makes it a little bit more difficult. But you know, with friends at at school and everything else, to be able to be truly who I am. And what would you say, you know, after being there for three semesters, is the um, I mean, aside from the LGBT Resource Center itself, what would you say is the general kind of the climate on campus in terms of for people who identify as LGBT or Q, um, in terms of how faculty interact with, with you or uh, other students or just in terms of policies they may have? I mean, what's your, what's your sense of, of, of where Grand Valley is around uh, those kinds of equality issues? I feel, in my experience, has been that um, Grand Valley seems to be very accepting. But not only that, and this is what gives me hope, is they want to know more. And that is what's crucial, because you can't just sit there and saying, I know all. You know, and I don't feel like Grand Valley, the students, the campus, everything that truly makes up Grand Valley sits there and goes, I know all. You know, um, everybody wants to know more. And they want to continue to know more so that they can um, move towards the process of making everything um, equal and, um, in, and include everybody. And that's what's crucial. And, you know, there has been, you know, times that, you know, you're walking down campus and we saw on a, a pot that had plants on it, someone um, scribbling faggot on it. Mm. You know, you have individuals who will do stuff like that. Um, you'll have people coming in, um, preachers, uh, and in the free speech zone saying things that are very, um, you know, hurtful and feed into, you know, because I also have then religious um, students come up to me and say, you know, he's right because of this. And then, you know, so it, it sometimes has a climate of hostility, but for the most part, most people are very open and very willing to understand um, and try to, you know, learn more, you know, and grow with the process. And that's, you know, very crucial. Uh, with the greater Grand Rapids area, whenever um, I'd walk down, like, the streets of Grand Rapids, I feel, you know, fairly safe uh, versus I would not do that from where I'm from and in the, in the cities that's around there. Because uh, I know when I went on my first date with my current girlfriend, um, we did get heckled and harassed. Um, we were, happened to be walking down um, by the river and we were holding hands and we had two gentlemen uh, follow us. Mm. You know, I had to constantly turn around and give them looks of, hey, back off. Um, otherwise, you know, neither one of us need to deal with this right now. And uh, because I had, I was going to do what was necessary so that there was no hostility going on. Uh, they finally left us alone after walking down the one whole side of the river. And then we had came back around the other way. And we were heading back to uh, my car and we had a bus of students that happened to pull out of GV. Um, it, it were marked from a different university. So I think it was some kind of like um, sport thing that was going on. And how we found out that it was all males was uh, they all came, they almost flipped the bus. They all went to the one side that we were walking by, mm. hooting and hollering, saying um, derogatory names, banging on the windows. Mm. Uh, and like I said, almost flipped the bus while we were walking by. Mm. You know, uh, my girlfriend wanted to turn around and flip them off and I kept telling her, no, <laughs> you know, don't add to it. We just, we need to keep walking. But for the most part, we walk around downtown quite a bit holding hands and we don't feel like people are gonna come up and like throw stuff in our face or spit in our face or anything like that, so. And you've had some involvement with the Trans Spectrum Group on campus as well. I'm actually the current president. Oh, you're the current president. Can yes. you talk about the kind of, um, kind of issues or kind of work or kind of focus that the, that the organization, that the student group is uh, you know, involved in these days? We're a, we're a service and advocacy group, and we're big in um, serving not only Grand Valley, but the greater Grand Rapids community. We feel that that's very crucial. And uh, like our meetings are not open, just open to our students, but also to the greater area where um, trans individuals can come in and join us as well. You know, they can't vote in certain things like that because it is a student organization. 
However, uh, you know, it's, it helps bring in um, a different perspective because then you have a little bit more of an age range going on. Um, instead of, uh, you know, I'm a non-traditional student, but I'm a rare, um, except unlike them, most of them are like 18 to like 22. So that helps, um, and it helps with our process of trying to educate the greater community. We do a lot of like cut and paste is one of our big um, educational pieces that we do at least two of them each semester. And what it is, is like our first one we did Trans 101. And we actually did that twice because we wanted to make sure that people who couldn't make it the first time had opportunity who wanted to, to see it a second time. And just that introduction, because there was just so much um, with talking to people that they just wanted to know the basics. You know, what does it mean to be trans? What does trans mean versus transsexual versus genderqueer? And we touched that. And then we go in depth after that, you know, what's the process of FTM, MTF, you know, what, what does, how does androgyny um, mix in all that. And then uh, we also do a lot of uh, being involvement in different events like National Coming Out Day, um, TDOR, um, Transgender Day of Visibility, uh, different um, events that we're trying really hard to work with the, um, with the HIV AIDS group and um, several different groups besides ONA and SAFE um, on campus to work with them to be involved on all aspects of the uh, community because yes, we may be trans students, however, we have many different aspects that impact our lives. We're not just students and we're not just trans, we're human beings so we're multifaceted. And so we wanna touch all those bases as well. You know, in my own sort of investigation or reading of, of uh, you know, LGBTQ <coughs> issues, that one thing that seems to be clear is that trans folks are most, the most marginalized or the ones that sort of suffer maybe more the brunt of, you know, kind of systemic injustice, whether it's police abuse or <laughs> courts or uh, prison, like what, you know, the, the the prison system doesn't know what to do with people yeah. who don't identify as male or female. And, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, so there's all these sort or of- Or as part of transition and not transition. fully, you know, looks male, but on the birth certificate female. Right, yeah. right. Or even people don't realize that, you know, with the, uh, the, the Obama administration sort of pa finally passing, don't ask, don't tell, that it doesn't include yes. trans, yep. uh, transgender folks. So. Uh, it seems like there's just um, a whole lot more, uh, uh, it's a whole more difficult, you know, there doesn't seem to be um, an awareness amongst folks, even within the LGBT community, that sort of the trans population still doesn't, is sort of kind of to some degree marginalized or they don't realize that the, what issues may be more important to you are maybe not the same thing to folks who identify as gay or lesbian. Mm -hmm. what, what would you say about that? I'd have to say that's true. That's um, one thing that I ran into uh, when I first uh, started really being um, out as much as possible because um, unfortunately my job when um, I was on the other side of the state wouldn't let me because when you work for the Roman Catholic Church, you can't exactly be out because you're gonna lose your job. And as, as of when I turned 18, I, everything became my responsibility. So I obviously couldn't lose my job at that point. And, but I still would go to the meet and greets and be involved as much as I can. And one of the things that I noticed right away, um, because there wasn't too many people my age, so I listened to a lot to the older LGBT individuals. And I'm not saying that this is representative of all um, 50 plus year old lesbians, but in my circumstances that I experienced, this was the rule instead of the exception, was that uh, they didn't understand what it meant to be trans. Mm. And so it was easier for me to identify at that time as a lesbian because when, it, when someone identified as trans, there was all these inappropriate questions. Mm -hmm. um, it was more as if the trans individuals were things that needed to be prodded and probed poked instead of, you know, a human being who needed to have, you know, it, 
if your curiosity, if your curiosity is going wild, there's this thing called Google, and it's very helpful, and you don't have to go and ask the individual. Not saying that all of it's accurate, but some things just, it's not something you should ask when you first know somebody. Well, and, and another part of the history that's been interesting is that um, when I saw this, uh, I mean, obviously, there's you know, Stonewall, which people quite often <laughs> sort of put in sort of a, kind of the watershed moment, but several years before that in San Francisco at the, the Compton Cafe riots, it, it was very similar kind of circumstances, and, but in both cases, it, were, it was folks who identified as trans who were the kind of the ones at the front line. So mm -hmm. some people certainly would argue that there's these transgender folks who are kind of been the sort of the, you know, the ones who have really pushed, uh, that have been sort of at the forefront of whatever um, contemporary LGBT movement that exists. Mm -hmm. um, but that um, doesn't seem to be acknowledged a whole lot, that it's really trans folks who are really ones who have taken the most risk and have done mm -hmm have been sort of been the most uh, uh, assertive around sort of uh, pushing for those kinds of issues. Um, and, you know, why do you think that's the case, that that sort of, maybe that element of the history doesn't seem to be kind of, you know, always acknowledged? Well, I think because most people see it as, you know, it's strange, it's weird, let's not talk about it. And as a sociologist, I know that most movements are used, usually done on the backs of the most minority group within the minority group. You know, it's been shown time and time again. Um, I've wrote papers on it. Um, you know, that's typically how it's happened. Um, excuse me. <coughs> so, so it's it's not at all surprising. And plus, if you really think about it, um, you know, typically, you know, the 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 T in the LGBT, uh, you know, has to you know fight for a lot more. It's not just sexual orientation, and some of them may not even have to fight for their sexual orientation. Uh, there's but there's going to be dress. There's going to be how do you act, you know, at work versus at home, um, friends, you know, attitudes. How are you not seen as because like <clears throat> if I'm very masculine at work. I'm seen as a very butchy, um, bitchy feminist, mm -hmm. you know, versus um, then if a, a biological male goes to work who's um, a trans female, you know, he's a weak pussy who can't stand up for himself at work. You know, there's a lot of dynamic and um, different things at play versus if it's just uh, who are you sleeping with? So I'm not, I wasn't at all surprised when I saw that. I know I watched the, um, the Stonewall events on the PBS version of it, and you know how they would uh, go and you had to have three articles of their biological gender, mm -hmm. you know, and people are creative like that, right. you know, and, um, and it's not just um, in the LGB community, the trans community is extremely creative as well. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's unfortunate that that happens, that, you know, that the trans people are the minority within the minority group and has to work so hard and is usually in the forefront and have most to lose, it seems like, sometimes. Mm -hmm. But maybe that's just my biased opinion. But, uh, you know, it's, it happens throughout all of history, so I'm not surprised. Um, but I do think that um, LGBT community um, individuals that I've worked with are more and more going back to the history books, mm -hmm. looking at things, and I think they are trying really hard to make things more of an equal movement to move forward instead of this uh, going back and forth of, you know, well, since you're even smaller numbers than us LGB individuals, so we're gonna move forward for our rights and not for yours. Not saying that there isn't that divide there, because I have seen it firsthand. Mm -hmm. but, um, but it seems like, especially in the younger generation, it's not quite going that way. Uh, there's more movement towards, you know, oh, you know, T is being left off, let's try really hard to get gender expression um, on the ED, EDNA, is that, 
I don't remember the acronym for it. Either. I can't think of it. But the equality one, right. you know, they're trying to keep, you know, gender in there instead of just going, hey, you know, let's just push for sexual orientation. Right, right. Well, uh, back to Grand Valley just, just briefly, because you, you said earlier that you think that in many ways uh, it's been a really positive experience for them that, and that the climate is, is generally pretty healthy and that people are always wanting to, to learn more, to, mm -hmm. to, to be open to learning more. What would you say needs, what would you say if you sort of had a, you know, influence in determining sort of direction, you know, what would you say needs to happen that would make Grand Valley more accepting, more inclusive, uh, and more understanding, uh, particularly of, uh, of folks who identify as trans? Uh, I would have to say that with um, Grand Valley, it would definitely have to be, um, Okay, how am I going to wear this? Um, there's always bureaucracy in institutions, and some of that has to quit. Uh, you know, I, I love Grand Valley, don't get me wrong, but, um, you know, things in the structure are, um, are not happening properly, unfortunately. Um, I have a friend, um, because this individual is trans, went through seven different roommates and had the possibility of being um, expelled out of school, be, well, out of housing, because went through seven different roommates. That shouldn't have happened. You know, there's just different, you know, I know other trans individuals who've gone through different roommates and have anxiety about going into this year because don't know how roommates are going to deal with, you know, them being trans. Mm -hmm. That shouldn't be at play. Um, when you're working with individuals to give them a healthy um, environment to learn and to be educated, you should not be uh, in a, an environment of turmoil and for, you know, for one student, let alone a group of students. And so that's one of the biggest aspects besides making sure that um, faculty and students who are trans, you know, has the same rights as um, cisgendered individuals when it comes to everything across the entire board because uh, you know the faculty and staff as as far as I know you know the trans um, individuals who may be on uh, staff don't have the total like health benefits and rights that a cisgendered individual does and that's something that needs to be really considered and looked at because that's a basic human right for a trans individual. Have you personally or the trans spectrum um, group been involved in the gender neutral housing efforts on campus? Yes, um, several of us um, are part of the coalition. Uh, um, I am, I haven't been able to be as very active because um, they were meeting when I couldn't meet with them. But yes, that's a big thing for many of the members on Trans Spectrum because, you know, that's a movement towards uh, allowing trans individuals to have a safe environment on campus. Because some people have no option except to live on campus. I think that's sometimes forgotten in the midst of it all, is that for some people it's not a luxury to live off of campus because that's the only option they have is to live on campus. Okay. Well, maybe as a way of, uh, of wrapping up here, um, because this is a history project and mm -hmm. we're going to have this stuff archived and hopefully people will look at it 20, 30 years down the road, it, it, assuming that's the case. And, um, and hopefully there will be, you know, forward thinking uh, high school civics teachers or, um, or history teachers who want to share this information with their students. So assume that, you know, high school kids are going to be looking at this. And mm -hmm. What might you say to them? Or what words of encouragement might you have for them, particularly students who themselves are sort of struggling with their own identities? Uh, what, what kind of words would you want to pass along if they're watching this a few decades down the road? Easy question, I know. Yeah. I know. <laughs> you know, let's encompass all that in a right. few seconds. Sure, sure, sure. <laughs> um, I think I would tell them what I would tell myself if I had to write myself something that I knew I was going to watch in 20 years from now. Um, and hopefully, you know, I'm uh, part of that new younger generation that's helping moving um, Grand Rapids forward. 
and you know we hear a lot of you know it gets better and we do need to hear those positive things and you know life does get better as you get older however you know it's hard it's it's really hard it's really difficult um, you'll meet roadblocks that you didn't expect to meet um, you may feel at times a little bit desperate um, you know some may even feel suicidal but um, but as you keep walking each step and sometimes that's all you can do is look at the next step uh, and you know you can just do the best you can and you know you can't make and say oh these are going to be the laws in the next 10 years. You have no say in that, but you do have the say in your next step. So, and if you screw up, you know what? You're still young, even, you know, even if you're 40, 50 years old, you're still young. You can, you can still screw up, that, up at that time, but you can make another step that helps correct that and moves everybody forward, including yourself. And because everybody makes mistakes and you have to be able to be willing to forgive and laugh at yourself. But one of the biggest things besides doing that is never quit educating yourself. And deep down always listen to how you feel about everything because you're going to be told a lot from the outside of how you should feel about liking somebody or your own gender identity and you know what you should do with your career field because you know because you're male you should be going only in these or because you're female you should only be going in these you need to tone that down a little bit and just take some time to listen to you great well i didn't have any other questions but if there's something we haven't talked about that you'd like to address feel free to to add to it otherwise you know um thanks for taking some time to come out and talk to us but <laughs> well thank you for doing this okay great